I dislike this microphone so much. Hi everyone. I hope everyone is doing well. I wanted to catch you up on some books I've gotten into and a book that I bought when I was in Colorado. Gosh, was that last week? I came back last week, midweek. So I, yeah, I'll catch you up on everything. I have a clip that I'll play in a second that I recorded while I was in Boulder after I bought this book, which is called Tendrils by a woman named Anne Waldman, which I will get into. It has a connection with Boulder and with um, a place there called Naropa University. And I'm just was so interested and poetry. That's the other cool thing. But anyway, I recorded this clip, which I've now listened back on because I was convinced that no part of it was coherent, worth playing. But I do talk about the book that I've mentioned a couple times. I didn't say. <clears throat> I've talked a couple times about jo Joe Hamia's The Hypocrite, or at least once. And in this clip, I give an update on it. Hey everyone. I'm assuming I've done a intro before this clip starts, but isn't this a beautiful wall <laughs> in this... Uh, bungalow, bohemian bungalow that we're staying at in Boulder, Colorado. It's crazy. Oh my gosh. I love this place. So we're here in Boulder. We love to go up to a mountain town called Nederland and do some hikes from Nederland, which is in the mountains, up to the top of some hikes in uh in higher altitude they're really challenging hikes and i adore them and netherland has my favorite coffee house ever and i must go there anytime we're in this area so that's what we've been doing we're going to go to netherland again tomorrow before we fly home on thursday we, I'll just say really quickly before I talk to you about the books is um, on this trip, we also, we actually did something different than normal. We usually stay in Boulder and just go everywhere in the mountains hiking and um, sometimes climbing the flat irons. This time we specifically stayed near Pikes Peak so that we could hike to the top of Pikes Peak, which is one of Colorado's 14ers. I've never climbed, I'm sorry, hiked to the top of a 14er. Um, I've probably gone, like we did another hike that's a, topped out at 12,500 feet, but this is a very specific peak climb and, um, or hike, and that was fantastic. Uh, that was an experience of a lifetime. Um, altitude sickness at the top, queasiness, worst headache I think I've ever had, meaning a migraine, but then we had to hike down and it was crazy. <laughs> Highly recommend. But anyway, uh, one of my favorite things to do here in Boulder is go to the Boulder bookstore. I did that last year and not, not specifically with any need to buy anything. Um, some of you who have been around for a while know that I don't buy a lot of books. And if I do, they are used primarily. I am about two thirds of the way through The Hypocrite. And I continue to really enjoy the way that Joe Hamya is breaking up these chapters in Sophia, who's the daughter of the mother and father who are characters in this book. They are divorced. And the father looms really large because he's a very famous novelist and she is becoming a playwright and has a play that's being put on that her father is attending and doesn't know that this play may have or may be based on uh, real life and a period of time when Sophie, I think as a teenager, um, spent some time with her father while her father was writing a novel. 
So he's being surprised as he's watching this play and we're a part of that. I don't know whether I care or like any of these characters. I just really enjoy the writing. I did really enjoy the part that happens about the middle. I marked the page, even though this is a library book and I really shouldn't mark the page. So I'll mark it. But there is a scene where there's a intermission in the play and her father, I mean, does he have a name? I don't know. But the father during the play intermission goes out to take a cigarette break. He meets this other, this woman who's out there taking a cigarette break. And this woman knows the father author and she has got some opinions about him and they have this banter if you want to call it going on in the alleyway or whatever smoking their cigarettes and it's so good I'm not going to spoil it I don't know we'll see we'll see about this one I'm enjoying it I'm enjoying the reading experience and as I continued reading this book which I've now finished the very last section called part four exit pursued by his daughter you have a, like a very close third person who is now addressing the reader and that's a unique part of the book you're left with the question of who is the hypocrite thinky it's a thinky book after you're reading it not really while you're reading it and that's probably the best kind for me book that i bought at the boulder bookstore is called Tendril, A Meeting of Minds. And what she, the poet Anne Waldman means is the meeting of some Buddhist minds and the meeting of the beat poet's minds. So Anne Wald Wald Waldman was a group of so-called beat poets in the 1950s, like after World War II. Um, they were uh, tagged as beatnik or beat poets in the 50s and 60s. And um, these are people like Allen Ginsberg and William Burroughs and Ann Waldman. Development, the early days of the Naropa University, which was called, I think, the Naropa Institute when it was first formed in Boulder. And it's a very unique place because it's goal was to combine Buddhist practices with um, poets' minds and that there is a uh, crossroad or even a connection between Buddhist practices and mantras and with the poetics, so to speak. I don't know if I finished my thoughts on To the Lighthouse with, uh, by, by Virginia Woolf. But I'll just say that I was fascinated by the change in uh, tempo from the first section to the second section to the third section. Very intentional from what I've read um, by Virginia Woolf. This is a fascinating book in and of itself because of that, but also because of um, such an interior experience of all the people, all the characters in the book. It's fascinating in that way. It has made me want to go back to reading Mrs. Dalloway, which I read in like October of 2022 or the fall of 2022, right before I started the booktube channel, because I was reading it as part of a read along, a bookstagram read along. And we had read the Voyage Out, the first Virginia Woolf fiction, and then Mrs. Dalloway, and I was blown away by Mrs. Dalloway. And before I go on to read her other work, which I'm going to do that very slowly, I'm in no hurry to read Orlando or something like that, but I do want to go back to Mrs. Dalloway and just relive that first reading experience because it was quite extraordinary. From Shorty September, and one of the ones that I mentioned was Carson McCullers, the member of the wedding. I haven't read a Carson McCullers. And I knew it had a young female protagonist in it. It's 12 year old Frankie. And I started reading it. It's a very distinct Southern style of writing, but I kept in my mind comparing it to, we have always lived in the castle by, who is that by? I loved that female main character so much 
that I couldn't let go of that character. And I found myself feeling like, oh, but that's not that other book. And I love that other book. And I, I'm not really jive, I'm not really getting along with the voice of, or the writing style. And I can't even describe to you what I mean by that. But then as Frankie's character developed and the characters around her, her brother, her brother is getting married before he goes off to war or back to war. This is in the 40s. And just the characters around her are so strong. And especially family made, as she's described here, um, Bernice. And her six-year-old male cousin, wow, he doesn't, doesn't feel like he's six. I think his name's John Henry. Oh, she is like she is like Pippi Longstocking to me. And at times, because of how she's growing up, Bernice, who is so, such an important part of this story and has such um, a meaningful relationship to Frankie, because there is no mother in this story, just kept feeling more and more attached to Frankie. Because she's going through a existential crisis of not wanting to be her, not wanting to be in the town anymore. She's using this wedding as a way to say, you know what, after the wedding, I'm leaving town. I'm not coming back. I'm a grown up now. And she gets to a point where she wants to be called F Jasmine. <laughs> Jasmine must be her middle name. This was such a delight. And then I had picked up an Annie or no, Called the young man <clears throat> super super short this is about her having a relationship with a much younger man maybe 20 or 25 years younger than her similar to another book that i had read like this but it's just a pleasure to be in her voice and as i was looking at my bookshelf and shorter books I finally got to Sandra Cisneros, The House on Mango Street. This is a, is a series of very short vignettes. So they're not complete short stories. They're just vignettes about the main character whose name is Esperanza Cordero. These vignettes are sometimes heartbreaking, sometimes deeply joyous in the story of a young Latina girl growing up in Chicago, inventing for herself who and what she will become. She is very interested in being someone beyond the neighborhood that she's living in uh, they don't have very much money but they do they do eventually move into an individual house on mango street she makes clear that it's still very run down and not a very nice pleasant place to live but her parents are very glad that they're living in an, a standalone house and not in an apartment anymore but this was such a delight i i highly recommend it i I watched a video while I was on the plane. Uh, one of the YouTube videos, the booktube videos I watched was from Reed Red. Reed Red. I don't know his first name. I actually don't know if he's ever said his first name, but he is a um, just lovely booktuber from Australia. I think he must live in Sydney. He just did an extraordinary bookshop haul or bookshop vlog of him visiting his favorite Sydney bookstores that I highly recommend. But I saw that he had a video about Nabokov. I'm going to say Nabokov because I can't remember now if it's Nabokov or Nabokov. But I had started reading Lolita and put it down just because of the subject matter was a little too much for me, even though what I appreciated about it and why I really was hesitant to put it down was the cynical the, or the satirical voice where this is a creepy person. Is it his name Humboldt Humboldt or something? And he's written straight. And there's nothing more effective than writing a character straight when they are knowingly disgusting or, or, or even funny. And that's really where the satire comes in. So I was super interested in reading something else by Nabokov and Reed Red does a rundown of Nabokov. He loves the writer and his favorite book is called Pale Fire. So as I was online, I went ahead and put a hold on Pale Fire and I got it. And yeah, this is unique. I did not read the whole thing. I will just say that. This, an ingeniously constructed parody 
that's really the cool part of this book. Detective fiction and learned commentary. Pale Fire offers a cornucopia of deceptive pleasures at the center of which is a 999 line poem written by the literary genius John Shade just before his death. Surrounding the poem is a foreword and commentary by the demented scholar Charles Kinboat, who interweaves adoring literary analysis with a fantastical tale of an assassin from the land of Zembla, and so on. I read this poem. It's extraordinarily written. There's a few, I think, four cantos or something. Extraordinarily written. I also read the foreword by the literary, so-called literary genius, or the demented scholar Charles Kinboat. So apparently John Shade, the fictional John Shade, was a neighbor of sorts to Charles Kinboat. And it becomes very clear, even in, in the introduction, that Charles feels like John uh, and he were friends. And so Charles takes the poem and makes commentary about it, weaving in parts of his own life, of course. I'm not going to read this whole thing at this point, but I am so glad that I dipped into this because Reed Red mentioned it as his favorite, Nabokov. And then I did pick up his other, the other book that he mentioned, which is Penin. And I started reading it. Um, it's pretty dense. I love the language. I'm just not in the mood to keep this library book out for a long time. I really want to take my time with it. So I am going to look for a used copy of Penin to work my way through it. But highly recommend the Nabokov video from, uh, from Read Red. I think that's it. I am not actually re I'm out of books. I'm about to go to the library right now. I have a few holds. A few of them are like books of essays. What I am looking forward to that's not at the library yet, but I have a hold on it are two books out from the Dorothy Project, the My Beloved Dorothy Project. I love to give almost anything that they produce a try because it's so very well curated. So the Renee Gladman book, my lesbian novel is it called that's on order or at least i'm on hold in a holding pattern at the library and then i just put on hold i'll put the book here because now i'm drawing a complete blank total cover like almost entirely a cover attraction to me but i did read the excerpt from it um, that i was able to find somewhere so i'm really interested. This is a debut novel. I think it's Swedish. I've never actually read a Renee Gladman either, so I'm looking forward to getting that, that one eventually. Let me know what you're up to. Do you have a favorite Nabokov? Thanks for joining me. Let's continue the conversation in the comments. I hope to see you on the next one.